So our second speaker is Anastasia Pentazapulu. She's a PhD candidate at the Department of Plastics at the University of Florida, and she holds a BA in Philology and an MA in Classics from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, Greece. She is currently working on her dissertation, which, ex which explores the sociocultural dynamics of space in spectacle-oriented stories as performed in ancient and contemporary theater, cinema, and digital live streaming environments. Her paper today is entitled, Turning Home into Stage, The Case of Euripides Medea and David Fincher's Amy Dunn in Gone Girl 2014. So thank you, welcome Anastasia. Thank you, Dr. Day. Uh, let me thank again the uh, organizers for uh, this exciting uh, conference and thank you all for being here. So uh, Deborah Bodecker has argued that Euripides Medea behaves as author or director of her own story as she frequently plans, rehearses or comments on her own speech and directs the words and actions of other characters as well. This paper discusses Euripides Medea as an authorial figure in parallel with the 2014 film Gone Girl directed by David Fincher. Uh, more specifically, um, my focus is on the protagonists of the two stories, Medea and Amy Dunn, and their transformation of the domestic space, their home, into a metadramatic stage to avenge themselves and reconstruct their fragmented social domestic identity after their husband's betrayal. I contend that Amy Dunn, just like Medea, turns her home into a stage to punish her unfaithful husband, Nick. By drawing parallels between Medea's and Amy's domestic spatial relations, I show how the familiar domestic space emerges as a hostile stage that serves as an avenging mechanism. Finally, I argue that by the end of the play and the film respectively, both Medea and Amy have established themselves as the dominant characters of their tragic stories by transforming the domestic space into a powerful tragic stage. The term stage I use here denotes the physical or imagined spaces where the characters of plays and films put on their performances, whether these are hosted by an actual stage in theater or screen in cinema. Both in Medea and Gone Girl, the characters become either actors or audience members of the performance within the performance that the real life actors are putting on and the spectators are watching. Thus, the characters transform certain localities of the story world into dynamic performing spaces, essentially recreating the quintessential illusionary experience that a theatrical performance constructs. Euripides Medea is set in front of Medea's home in Corinth, where until recently she lived with Jason, their sons, and the household slaves, the nurse and the tutor. In the opening scene of the play, the nurse enters a performing space exiting Medea's house and explains Medea's situation and her fears for what she might do to herself or her sons because of her grief for Jason's betrayal. From the very beginning, Medea develops as a sympathetic character in the audience's mind, described by other women in the play as a woman in grief and distress. Bo Dacre states that, and I quote, at the beginning of the play, Medea is above all an object of pity, recently abandoned by the man for whom she betrayed home and family, and now about to be exiled, end of quote. Throughout the prologue, Medea is heard crying always from within the house, the dominant space of theatrical action, even instigating the Corinthian women to enter the performing space. When the women of the chorus arrive, the nurse informs them that Medea's house does not exist anymore since her husband is marrying into the royal family. Medea's socio domestic identity as a wife, which secured her status in the Corinthian society according to the Athenian norms, is no more. From inside the house, Medea is heard contemplating her death now that her husband has shattered their home and she cannot return to her paternal oikos, having killed her brother to escape with Jason. Bernard Gridley argues that, uh, quote, the cumulative effect of the 200 lines before Medea's appearance is to create the sense of her singularity and dominance, end of quote. Indeed, the prologue introduces Medea as the controlling figure of the performing space, despite her physical absence, since her cries move the action and the responses of the onstage characters. Her voice heard from inside the skinny echo echoes her wretchedness while the onstage characters reconstruct her story and current situation in a way that earns her, and, um, excuse me, earns her, and hers the audience's sympathy. Similarly, in the first part of Gone Girl, Amy emerges as an object of pity. Gone Girl traces the mysterious story of the disappearance of Amy Dunn, a former New York journalist who was living a happy married life in North Carthage, Missouri with her husband Nick Dunn, a creative writing instructor and bar owner. 
On the morning of their fifth wedding anniversary, Nick rushes home after receiving a phone call from his neighbor to find a meticulous, meticulously arranged fight slash crime scene and his wife missing. The movie is organized in two almost equal parts, the story that Amy wants, wants the on and off screen audience to believe and the real story. Neither of the two follows an exactly linear structure. The first part begins in the now of the story world, uh, July 5th, 2012, and features extensive flashbacks in the form of a diary narrative where we see Amy's manipulated version of her love story and married life with Nick. Amy is not physically present in the now of the film when she is thought to be gone and possibly murdered. The second part of the film, though, begins with her on July 5th, explaining how she framed her husband for her disappearance and continues by going back and forth between the slightly off by four days current timelines of hers and Nick's realities until the two finally meet. Once Nick reports his wife missing, things escalate quite quickly. The Don home is turned into an investigation scene as the police discover evidence of a poorly concealed find, uh, fight in their kitchen, while Ames' disappearance gains wide media coverage since, at his, as it is revealed in one of the flashbacks, she was the inspiration for the protagonist of her parents' beloved and popular series of children's books, Amazing Amy. Despite not being physically present in the now of the story world in the first part of the film, Amy is the center of attention. And as it will be revealed in the second part, the driving force of the plot and the insert performance that is staged to frame Nick. Through her embedded retrospective diary narrations, Amy achieves to create for herself the image of an ordinary woman who leads a dreamy married life until her husband abandons his married man role and finally betrays her. Her portrayal as a brilliant woman by her parents and a victim by her best friend, Noelle, contribute to her sympathetic profile and gain her the support of the internal audience. Simultaneously, the flashbacks which depict the couple's heartwarming love story, her challenging childhood growing up in the shadow of Amazing Amy, the gradual fragmentation of their marriage and the revelation of Nick's extramarital affair, render her an innocent wife who is trapped in a violent domestic life in space. Amy seeks and achieves to become America's sweetheart for both the internal and external audience. The diary flashbacks reveal that although she was a New Yorker at heart, she moved to Missouri, her husband's hometown, and became a foreigner in a place where she could not assimilate. After her forced settlement in Missouri, Amy is almost always presented inside the couple's spacious McMansion house with a clean-shaped exterior and the perfectly styled yet dark and lifeless interior. The misplaced New Yorker exists inside this magazine cover home, which as her marriage falls apart, turns into her base prison. Her seclusion inside a trembling domestic space as, painting, as painted in her diary narrations illustrates her sole identification as a dedicated wife and highlights her growing isolation both from the community and her own husband, reminding us of Medea and Euripides' prologue. As if she were Medea, Amy compromises and sacrifices her previous social roles in life in the name of love, but her husband falls short of her standards and expectations. Medea and Amy have thus far been portrayed as women in a liminal state and a shattered socio-domestic special entity, which however they're about to alter. When Medea finally steps outside her home into the performing space with a deconstructed socio-domestic identity as a result of being deserted by her husband, she meditates on her position and the general unequal status of women. Her exit from the skinny onto the performing space demonstrates spatially her liminal status and her passage to a new identity and role. Her new spatial status renders the performing space as the primary setting of the action, but does not remove the focus of the off, uh, from the offstage area and the imagined interior space of the home, which functions as a symbol of Medea's otherness and is visually connected with the children. They have just went inside uh, just a while before Medea exited through the same door. Medea seeks to repurpose her disintegrated socio-domestic existence and translate her feelings into a revenge plot that will distract Jason's oikos, becoming the prime mover of Euripides' play and the author of her insect performance. She expresses her intention to find a way or a scheme to punish her husband, even asking for the chorus's silence, and methodically proceeds with the performance of her deceptive plan. Medea establishes her control over the performing space, deceiving or persuading her onstage counterparts and event eventually debating her vengeful plot aloud. 
Euripides' heroine exposes her initial plan after her encounter with Creon, who orders her to flee the city. Medea pretends to be a weak woman. Creon unwillingly becomes her internal audience while he watches her playing a role and surrenders himself to the power of the deceptive spectacle she presents, granting her the necessary time to stage her play and take revenge. After allowing her to stay for a day, Medea starts clearly taking on the role of the implied author as she reveals the first draft of her work, which involves the killing of Creon, his daughter, and Jason. However, she knows from the beginning that this plot might not lead her to a successful end. Thus, once she has found her haven in Aegis promise to accept her into Athens, she outlines the final version of her two-act instant play, the murder of the royal family and the murder of her sons. The first act of the Insta play stages the murder of the king and the princess. After the revelation of her revenge plot and the course's ineffective attempt to dissuade her from performing it, Medea briefly enters the house to prepare the fraudulent gifts. The interior of the house, the dominant theatrical space of the beginning of the play, becomes now an integral part of Medea's Insta play. Medea returns to her crumbling domestic space to set in motion the beginning of its end, marking with her special transition and her second entrance into the performing space, the beginning of her performance and the inauguration of her authorial identity. Upon her re-entrance, Medea dons the mask of the repentant woman in front of Jason, whom she stage manages into convincing his new bride to accept their children. Then, as a director, she carefully instructs her actress, her children, to go into the palace, offer her ruinous wedding gifts to Jason's new wife, and come back to her. The main action takes place uh, in, into the prince's imagined domestic space, which serves as a tragic stage for the performance of Medea's murderous plot. Although the conventions of fifth century uh, theater do not allow the audience to directly watch the spectacle that Medea has created, the messenger's vivid description animates the scene in front of the, their eyes and visually bridges the two opposing oiki. The procession towards the palace started with a servant bringing out of Medea's deconstructed home the deceitful gifts and giving them to the children to present them into the royal house in order to, without knowing it, destroy it. Once the boys uh, return, having been accepted to stay in a home that does not exist anymore, Medea debates with herself about performing the second act of her play, but eventually sends them inside their home. When the messenger arrives to announce the death of the princess and the king, he begins his narration with the image of the children entering the palace bearing gifts, inevitably evoking the preceding scene of the children going into their home, the place of their own murder, and the stage of the second act of Medea's instant play. The Medea presents not one, but two oiki that end as empty shells, writes Lusni, emphasizing that this oiki can never be reconstituted. They are truly no more. Having destroyed the royal house and Jason's prospect of starting a new oikos, in the second act, Medea stages the complete destruction of his current home to utterly deprive her disrespectful husband of his social status and image. Medea exits for the last time into the house and its doors close behind her once and for all. The children's voices from within allow the audience to reconstruct in their minds the scene that is being performed in the house. The gates of the house will not open again, despite Jason's push and will, because this oikos does not exist anymore. The interior of the house, both Medea's and the princess's domestic space, has been transformed into her one continuous metadramatic stage. Medea has now shattered the essence of home and literally shattered its special entity. At the end, she rises above it, having established her domination of the literal stage and her, her metadramatic stage. The dissolution of the domestic space is also a key component of Amy's inset performance. In the second part of the film, having almost convinced both her internal and external audience that Nick murdered her, Amy reveals herself to be alive and well. Driving in her car on the day of her presumed disappearance away from home, she declares that her husband will go to prison for her murder, which she orchestrated. For Amy, this is the fitting punishment for what he did to her especially because Missouri is a state that has a death penalty. The first time Amy is present in the relevant now of the film, she's not the fragile, scared, subservient woman and wife the audience met in the first part. Nick's betrayal crossed her domestic identity and turned her into the authorial figure that is now on the screen. 
Amy, the author, explains that whatever the internal and external audience had been watching for more than an hour was the performance of the script she wrote and carried out on her wedding anniversary, along with the insert characters she directed unbeknownst to them. In almost three minutes, she guides us step by step the external audience in flashback mode through the conceptualization and performance of her event's plot. First, Amy is shown she, uh, sitting at her kitchen table, doing research surrounded by murder-related books while watching crime shows. The next scene shows her outside her home, introducing herself to a pregnant neighbor. Amy methodically befriends Noelle, aiming at rendering her a future accuser of Nick during the investigation. She comes her with fake stories about Nick's violent behavior and acquaints herself with other pregnant women in all circle, creating in a sense her own chorus of females, friends, and supporters. Amy knows well the importance of appearances and seeming, and just like Medea, and she does not hesitate to pretend to be something she's not in order to achieve her goal. Thus, she steals Noelle's urine to fake pregnancy results because as she claims, America loves pregnant women and Amy needs her internal audience to like her. Finally, she creates corroborating evidence of Nick's guilt and plants her props in, the, in key spots for the police to find. She then revisits the strategic, strategic staging of the alleged kitchen uh, slash living room scene and uh, the fabrication of her diary entries. During the first part of the film, the couple's home serves as a key space where action takes place. Amy is constantly seen inside it and her diary flashbacks painted in the colors of an unsafe space, the exact opposite of what home should be. In the beginning of the second part, and more specifically in the retrospective picturing of the assemblage of Amy's plot, their house emerges as a dominant performing space. Amy uses her domestic space as her stage to deceive Noel and frame Nick. In both cases, she sets the action in the kitchen, the double-edged sword of domesticity the space that embodies family life and at the same time stands as a symbol of domestic isolation. To treacherously get Noelle's urine, she invites her over and they sit at the kitchen chatting while she is cooking and plying her friend with lemonade. To make sure that the police will suspect Nick for her disappearance, she meticulously rearranges the furniture in the living room, uh, which actually forms a large open uh, space area with the kitchen, to create the image of a fight scene, and then splatters her own blood across the kitchen and cleans it carelessly like Nick would. To avenge Nick for crushing the essence of their home and, and their, her own identity, Amy has turned its physical entity into a performative space, which exposes him as the one true actor of the crime. Amy's initial plot would end with her killing herself after the anticipated conviction and execution of Nick for her murder, convincing everybody once and for all that her husband was a culprit. However, she decides not to go through with her initial plan after reconsidering the reason for her death. Why should she die for Nick's idiocy after all? Yet, before she has the chance to finalize the new ending of her insect performance, she reaches a dead end after she is robbed in her hideout. The solution is found in the face of her ex-boyfriend, Desi, who emerges as her own Aegis. As if she were Medea, Amy deceives him by donning the mask of the abused woman, and he promises to protect her by offering her asylum in his lake house. However, Amy rewrites the end of her script, turning Desi into the culprit of her disappearance, after Nick's fake apology for his incompetence as a husband and his begging of her to come home on national TV minutes before he's arrested for her murder. Amy returns and gives an Oscar-worthy performance, putting the blame on Desi, whom she has killed supposedly in an act of self-defense. Nick and Amy stand now outside their home, posing for photos like a loving couple, but once they step inside, they take their masks off. Their domestic space and life are utterly broken. Nick announces that he's going to leave her, and Amy conceives the last act of her inset plot. Like Medea, she uses her unborn child to gradually destroy Nick. At first, she fakes a pregnancy to ensnare him and make him overtly hated, aiming at damaging his social image, the most important asset for a modern American man. At the end, though, she really gets pregnant in order to hold him hostage in a marriage he wanted to end long ago, thereby taking away his most precious right, freedom. Amy transforms their home into a prison for Nick and a stage for both of them since they silently agree to pretend to be a couple with a happily ever after ending. 
When their domestic identity and the image they had built for themselves is shattered, Medea and Amy represent themselves as the avenging implied authors of their own stories. The dissolution of their domestic space left them with a deconstructed social domestic identity, which they reconstruct through their authorial role. To avenge the injustice they have suffered, they uh, transform their home into a metadramatic stage and write an insect plot whose theme is the punishment of their husbands and the reinstatement of their self. At the end, Medea completely deconstructs Jason's oikos to definitively release herself from her previous identity, while Amy reconstructs her as a Nick's home as a prison cell for him, so that she can re-emerge as a domestic nurturing woman, confining him into the role she has written for him. Thank you. <laughs>